Today has been a day and three quarter. All right, I've asked somebody to let me know if they are seeing it over on YouTube because last week we did have this problem too. Oh boy. All right, so today, hopefully at 4.40, we can start on time. I'm just going to share over the YouTube just in case because I don't know what's happening again. All right. All right. Let me just start letting persons in here now. So just give me a few minutes um, to let persons in and then we can go ahead and start. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I'm just letting some persons in from the waiting room. Please, we sincerely apologize. We were trying to resolve a few technical issues. Just a few minutes, please, so we don't miss anyone. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm also apologizing if you're not seeing me. Our technical issues have decided to rear their ugly heads today, but we give God thanks in everything we do and we continue with our session. Welcome to our third session in our webinar series. My name is Cheryl and I'm the president of Omega Kappa. It means if you're not seeing my screen, let me just attempt to share a screen and you can let me know if you're seeing Anything? Anybody's able to see my screen or is it still blank? We're seeing your screen. All right. Yes, so thank see. you so much. All right. So as with our last two sessions, we have a small brain teaser to get our minds ready for what we're going to hear this evening. And so we're asking all the participants who are here and those of you who have joined us on YouTube, the brain teaser is going to be coming up and the instructions will be that you will have to write the number in the chat, you're gonna be timed. And when you've written the number in the chat, then that is when we're gonna contact you afterwards to find out if you can give us some evidence. Remember we do evidence-based practice. So I'm going to give one minute, one single minute, and you're gonna have to, let me fix it so you can see. One minute, I'm gonna bring it up on the screen and you're gonna have to tell me how many faces can you see on the screen? And then you also need to write maybe where you saw them because we need the evidence. So I'm starting the timer. Remember the instructions are, how many faces can you see in the picture? Write down the amount. And when you've completed the one minute, don't start writing, you know, no cheating from nurses. Then you put it in the chat. How many did you find? And then in your notes, you write maybe where you found it so that we can get the evidence. One minute starts right now. Go. So those joining us on YouTube, same instructions, write in the chat how many you found, and then you'll be able to verify with us just a little bit later. So you're looking at the picture and you are to find the faces. How many faces are you able to see?
All right, that's the timer. Time is up. So now the instructions are, please write in the chat, how many did you find? The number, write in the chat, how many faces did you find? And as we progress throughout the session, so we will be contacting you based on how many you found to see if you got it the most. All right, so with that being said, we thank you so much for your participation. I'm going to hand over to our lovely moderator this evening, Mrs. Judy Ann Henry Alexander, who will guide us through this session. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Gary Floyd. Good afternoon, everyone. Madam President, Cheryl Gary Floyd, members of the board of the Omega Kappa chapter of Sigma, esteemed presenters, Madam, Sandra Chisholm Ford and Joy It Aking, fellow O'Cares, colleagues all, good afternoon. Welcome to the third webinar in this series on infection prevention and control hosted by the Omega Kappa chapter of Sigma Theta Tau. This afternoon, we'll find us engaging in presentations on high level disinfection and sterilization. But before we proceed any further, here are a few reminders. To our participants on the Zoom platform, please remember to keep your mics muted at all times unless acknowledged by indication for a question or a comment. For participants on the YouTube platform, please remember to type your name, first and surname in the chat box. Kindly reserve questions until the end, as there will be a question and answer session at the end of both presentations. And our technical staff or team will help with the uh, question, articulating the questions so that I can pose them to our uh, presenters. Questions can be entered in the chat on either the Zoom or the, or the YouTube platform as well as I will acknowledge participants who raise their hands. The technical team will be working behind the scenes to ensure that there is a smooth transmission of this webinar. However, in the event of an audio or visual disruption, you will be promptly informed and the matter will be rectified as soon as we can do so. So without further delay, let me introduce our first speaker for this afternoon, Mrs. Sandra Chisholm Ford, who will guide us through the process of high-level disinfection. Mrs. Chisholm Ford is a registered nurse midwife and a public health nurse who has a certificate in nursing administration and a master of science degree in nursing education. She is a charter member of the Omega Kappa chapter of Sigma Theta Tau International and serves in the capacity of leadership chair. She is also an active member of the West, Indi West Indies Group of University Teachers and the Nurses Association of Jamaica. Without further ado, please help me welcome Mrs. Sandra Chisholm Ford. Mrs. Chisholm Ford, over to you. You may begin your presentation. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, OK members. Good afternoon, prospective members, because I'm sure at the end of all of this, many of you will be joining us by starting up your membership. And I want to thank the president and the executive of Omega Kappa for inviting me to do this presentation. So I will now share my screen. So today, as the chairperson ably reminded us, I will be looking at the topic of high-level disinfection. And as nurses, we all know the importance of 
infection control and prevention in the practice of nursing and as such high level disinfection. So disinfection is known as the process that eliminates many or all disease causing microorganisms except bacterial spores or on inanimate objects. In healthcare settings, objects usually have, usually are disinfected by liquid chemicals or wet pasteurization. There are three levels of disinfection and the first one and the one that we're gonna be focusing on today is high level disinfection that kills all vegetative microorganisms such as the microbacteria, lipids, non-lipid viruses, and fungal spores. But it does not kill all bacterial spores, it only kills some bacterial spores. Intermediate level disinfection kills microbacteria as well. It kills most viruses and bacteria, and it is what they use. Sometimes when you hear them talk about your um, air conditioning having a EPA filter, and EPA is an environmental protection agency that really controls the tuberculosis. The other level is low level disinfection, and this kills some viruses and bacteria. And I will go into the high level disinfection a little more. Um, Spalding, the Spalding's classification system. Um, some 30 odd years ago, um, this able gentleman identified the need to classify how we clean and disinfect um, instruments for use in patient care. So he said that reusable patient care items and equipment such as instruments or devices were to be placed in three categories. And the three categories were such as critical, semi-critical and non-critical. Anybody here? could hazard a guess as to what would come under a critical category. According to the degree of risk for infection. Mm. <laughs> what kind of equipment and instruments would be placed into the critical category? Surgical instrument. Surgical instruments, awesome. Instrument, of course. Awesome. So critical items would be the ones that pose the highest risk for infection if they are contaminated with any, any microorganism at all. So objects that are used inside body cavities, anything you're going to be putting in your veins, any, anything that is going to be used in this, during the surgical process, Anything you're going to be using on the heart or the urinary system, any implants or ultrasound probes are all classified as critical items. The semi-critical items are the ones that will be coming in contact with mucous membranes or non-intact skin. And that includes the respiratory therapy equipment, equipment that you're going to be using for anesthesia, such as your endoscopes, your laryngoscopes, your esophageal probes, your cytoscopes, your diaphragms, your speculae, and so on. So semi-critical items, normally these are the ones that we really, really focus our high-level disinfection on. Not the critical items or the non-critical items. The semi-critical items are the items that will require your high level disinfection. So your non-critical items, these pose no risk at all if they come in contact with intact skin, but not mucous membrane. And they include your bedpans, your blood pressure cuffs, your crutches, your um, thermometers, and so on. So the first part of 
your high level disinfection process is really your cleaning. And as Mrs. Gary Floyd speaks about technical challenges, my PowerPoint seemed to have done a thing of its own because the first step in the process of high level disinfection is really decontamination. And what is decontamination? Anybody, any ideas? We, have, we all do this on a regular basis as long as we handle patients and patient equipment and instruments that we use on patients. What is the first step? <clears throat> and what does the step entail? Anybody? Remove all of visible soil. The first step is decontamination, and this is when you place your instruments in a container for soaking. That is your first step. As I was saying, my slide seemed to be acting up on its own, but the, but the first step is decontamination. You soak your instruments in a one in 10 solution of bleach for decontamination. Your second step before you do your high level disinfection is cleaning. And this is where you're gonna be removing your visible soils, which is your or inorganic and, and organic material. So you're, if there's any dirt, any dust, if you had used an instrument and there is blood and mucous membranes, if you use your speculum and there is any vaginal discharge, if you used your your probe and there is mucus or stomach fluids, you will scrub those away. And it is through thorough cleaning. And thorough cleaning is essential before you do your high level disinfection and sterilization because if you leave any inorganic or organic material on the surface of the instruments, it will interfere with the high level disinfection process. What do you need? What instruments need to be high level disinfected? All cannulated items must be high level disinfected. Those of us who work in operating theater or suction cannulas, your phrase or pool suction tips, your endoscopes. And this is done using a three-step process. You flush first by passing lots and lots of water through the lumen of the cannulated item. Then you will be brushing. And the importance of brushing is that you need to, you need to use the correct size brush so that you can remove the debris and organic or inorganic items from the cannula. Using the correct brush size is critical because you, want, you don't want a brush size that is too large. If it is too large, the brushes will bend and it will not scrub away the debris. Or if the brushes are too small, the friction will not be adequate to remove the debris from the lumen of the cannula. And the next step is rinsing. So you flush, you brush, then you rinse. When you, what is the difference between disinfection and sterilization? Let me ask that question, anybody? Mrs. Mrs. My colleague Joy Aiken will be doing sterilization. What is the difference between sterilization and disinfection? Anybody? Anybody? Anything in the chat? No, I'm not seeing a hand or any comment in the chat at this time. Okay, 
All righty, let me tell you then. The difference is the organism that is removed. So in high level disinfection, remember I said, it removes all the microorganisms, excepting some endospores, bacterial endospores. High level disinfection will remove viral endospores, but not bacterial endospores. What removes all endospores is sterilization. So although high level disinfection is adequate for some um, instruments, it was not appropriate for all. When is disinfection appropriate? Anybody? It's right in front of you. You will disinfect any item that will come in contact with mucous membranes or non-intact skin using high, intermediate, or low levels. Disinfection and sterilization are essential for ensuring that all instruments does not spread pathogens to patients. We do not want our patients to come in without anything and leave with something they did not come with. You're protecting your patients from you and you're also protecting you from your patients. Many disinfections Disinfectants are used by themselves or in combination. I seem to be having my free, my, oh Lord. my screen is freezing up. So we're going to be looking at some of the items that we're going to be using in our high level disinfection process. The first one is alcohol. There are three main types of alcohol available and it's ethyl alcohol, methyl alcohol, and isopropyl alcohol. And all of us use alcohol all the time and I'm sure that not many of us pay attention to the type of alcohol that we use and whether or not it is effective for what we want it to do. These alcohols, these three are especially good for removing bacteria and tuberculoids and fungi. You may have some bactericidal or bacteriostatic properties of these agents. And anybody can say what does what is bactericidal compared to bacteriostatic? Anybody heard those two words before and, and know what they mean? And why are they yes. different? Yes, bactericidal kills bacteria, whereas bacteriostatic prevents the growth or stops the growth. Very good. The 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 suffix sidal means to die or to kill. And the suffix static means to stop. So anything that is sidal, so these, this side says that the alcohols are tubercul tuberculosidal, fungicidal, virucidal as well as bactericidal. But it does not destroy bacterial spores. So many of us have, have since COVID, we have developed a better appreciation for alcohol. We normally use it for cleaning sites when we, uh, we were doing injections or we would use it to clean the 
air pieces on our stethoscopes. We clean down our stethoscopes, our instruments, but we never, we were not using it in the sanitation process as we are now. Now it is one of the main things that we're using as hand sanitizers because alcohol actually denatures protein, the protein cells of the microorganism and that is how it gets its fungicidal, bactericidal, viricidal, and tuberculosidal properties. However, the concentration must be between 60 and 90% for it to be effective. So it, ethyl alcohol is bacteriostatic and bactericidal at concentrations between 60 and 80%. However, Isopropyl alcohol is more bactericidal than ethyl alcohol. So when you're buying your alcohol, you will check the bottle and isopropyl alcohol is the best one to buy. However, all of us here tend to, to panic when we hear people coughing because we worry a lot about tuberculosis and the spread and um, now we know that if we buy the ethyl alcohol, which is 95% eth ethanol, it kills the tubercle bacilli in sputum and water within 15 seconds. So if you feel that your instruments or anything is, has been exposed to the tubercle bacilli, applying this agent will um, kill that organism within 15 seconds. So alcohol has been used effectively in disinfection, in the use of oral and rectal thermometers, hospital pages, nurses' scissors or stethoscopes. Um, it has been used to disinfect um, the fiber optic endoscopes. We use toilets for years to disinfect small surfaces. Um, so as our um, medication vials or vaccine bottles or stethoscope or ventilators or CPR mannequins, ultrasound instruments, all our medication prep areas, alcohol has been the choice for high level disinfection. Somebody's marking on my screen. However, there are some disadvantages to alcohol use. It is not recommended for sterilizing medical or surgical materials, primarily because it does not call, um, kill spores and it cannot penetrate several protein rich materials. It is also fatal if it is used post operatively. And it, it was used at one point in wound infection with clostridium and the surgical instruments were contaminated with bacterial spores and it can cause problems. The other disadvantage is that the damage, the, the shell mounting for lens instruments, it swells and hardens rubber and certain plastic tubings after prolonged or repeated use. It bleaches rubber and plastic tiles. It damages tonometer tips. It causes a pacification of the cornea. Sometimes it is used um, in the eye clinic to sterilize or uh, to high level disinfect, I'm sorry, the instruments that are used to measure intraocular pressure. And if not allowed to dry properly, it can cause corneal opacification. Alcohol is also very flammable and consequently it must be stored in a cool, well-ventilated area. It also evaporates rapidly. And so if you're going to be using it to sterilize larger equipment, you need to have a whole lot so you can immerse the items completely. So we're now gonna be looking at chlorine and chlorine compound. This is the other um, solution that we use a lot of. And these chlorine and chlorine compounds are called hypochlorides. And the sodium hypochlorite is what we call our regular household bleach. And this is the liquid form. 
and the solid form is calcium hypochlorite, and this is our bleach powder. Advantages of this, it, they have broad spectrum um, antimicrobial properties. They do not leave toxic residues and they're unaffected by hard water. They're also in, inexpensive and they work very, very fast. They are very effective in removing dried or fixed organisms and biofilms on surfaces and have a low incidence of serious toxicity. So remember I said, the first phase of your high level disinfection is decontamination and hypochlorite, especially sodium hypochlorite, which we say is our regular household bleach, is the solution of choice for your decontamination process. There are some disadvantages, however, of chlorine and the sodium hypochlorite, as I said, the five in 5.25 to 6.15, it can produce irritation or, or pharyngeal irritation. If you just throw it on the surface, the, um, the gas that is formed can give, cause some amount of irritation to the eyes and the throat. It can be very corrosive on metals in high concentration. And many of you have, have, have proven this as well. When you do not dilute the bleach solution properly and you soak your instruments, after a while your instruments tend to rust and they deteriorate. It is, inactive, it is inactivated by organic matter. Let me explain this a little better. We, uh, we have been noticing that when there is um, a lot of spillage of blood, especially blood or bodily fluids, stool or vomitus, persons tend to throw a lot of bleach on it. When you throw the bleach on the, inner, on the organic matter like that, the organic matter inactivates the bleach. What you are required to do is to clean up the organic matter first, and then use the bleach solution, the one in, one in five, one in 10 bleach solution afterwards. The discoloration, another, discolor, is another disadvantage is that it discolorate, discolors our bleaches fabric. And we all know that many of us have lost some of our best clothing items to bleach. The other disadvantage releases a toxic chlorine gas when mixed with ammonia or acid. However, it is very effective for disinfecting your tonometer head, heads as well. It is very great for spot disinfection of our countertops and floors. The one in 10 to one in 100 solution is recommended for decontaminated spills and for small spills that are drops of blood on non-critical surface, the area can be disinfected with a one in 100 one in 100 dilution of um, household bleach. Um, remember I said earlier, because hypochlorites and other germicides are substantially inactivated by the presence of blood, large spills require that the surface be cleaned. I'm just repeating what I said earlier. It must be cleaned earlier. It must be cleaned before using the one in 10 solution for cleaning. Remove the large spills, remove the organic substance before you use your household bleach. And, and let me say, say, say I have gotten all my information from the Centers for Disease Control. Full strength bleach has been recommended for self disinfection of needles. So if some of us, um, some persons, some countries have a problem with IV drug users, and the solution is to ensure that they have a safe supply of needles to prevent um, disease transmission through the sharing of needles. So at this point, um, full strength bleach is allowed to be used because uh, we want to get as much of the organic agent from the lumen of the needles. And this is 
done when needle exchange programs are not available. It is used for irrigation in endodontic treatments. We use it again, as I said, for our mannequins, our dental equipment, and or to disinfect our waste before disposal. And we use it to clean our hemodialysis machines in between patients. This other chemical is something that we do not recommend to be used, but I will mention it nonetheless. It is very harmful, it's the most harmful of the ones I'm mentioning today. It is formalin or formaldehyde and persons must be very careful because you can, um, if you're not careful, mistake this one for another solution. Formaldehyde is used as a disinfectant um, and it's called formalin at that time. It is a bactericide, tubercularicide, fungicide, viricide, and sporicide. It, more than any other, kills most of the spores. That's why a lot of persons may tend to want to use this. However, OSHA determined that it should be handled very, very carefully because it is very carcinogenic and requires um, limited employee exposure to prevent the cancer causing effects. Um, if it is ingested, it can be fatal and the long-term exposure to low levels can cause skin irritations, asthma-like symptoms, dermatitis, and itchy. However, it is very good, very, very good as a microbicide. It, it inactivates the poliovirus within 10 minutes in a one in eight solution. It inactivates other viruses within 10 minutes in a 2% solution. It inactivates the tubercles, tubercle bacilli in two minutes in a 4% solution, and it inactivates the salmonella typhi in 10 minutes in a 2.5% solution. And this solution is the one that most of us know and use the Cydex or glutaraldehyde. This solution is acidic and generally is in that state, it is not sporicidal. So when you, you notice that the Cydex comes as a liquid with a little bottle of powder attached to it, so the liquid by itself is acidic. So when you add the sol solution, the powder, you activate the solution. And in doing so, you are making it alkaline. And at this point, it is very, very effective in removing spores. So without the powder, it will not remove spores. It, is, it just removes the organisms, but with the powder, it becomes alkaline and removes the spores. So once activated, the shelf life is 14 to 30 days. The advantages of glutaraldehyde it's excellent biocidal properties. So it works very, very good in the presence of organic matter. That doesn't mean that you're not to clean your speculae and your, and your probes and your cannulas properly before you immerse it. It is also non-corrosive. So it, it is better for preserving the integrity of your instruments. So your thermometers, your rubbers, your plastics, your metals will not disintegrate when left in it for a prolonged period. However, there are some disadvantages. There, is, there may be some amount of irritation to the glucaraldehyde vapor if when it is mixed. It has a pungent and irritating odor. It 
it's um, microbactericidal activity is very slow. That is why you need to soak it for longer periods to get the effect that you want. It coagulates blood and fixes tissue to surfaces. So we need to make sure that you, even though it kills the organism, it will leave the, the tissue, the uh, body, um, bodily fluid or whatever comes from the human body stick to the instrument. Hence, you need to properly clean before you start soaking in your glutaraldehyde solution. It may also cause allergic reactions or contact dermatitis. However, there is point that I want you to note. Disinfectants will kill all microorganisms that accept large numbers of bacterial spores on certain, at certain concentrations, but with short exposure time. So example, 20 minutes for 2% glu glucaraldehyde, and these are called high-level disinfectants. Some disinfectants act as chemical sterilants and will kill spores when with prolonged exposure. So your glucaraldehyde with prolonged exposure is no longer a high level disinfectant, it becomes a chemical sterilant. Intermediate level disinfectants might be cidal for mycobacteria, vegetative bacteria, most viruses and fungi, but does not necessarily kill your bacterial spores. And your low level disinfectants can kill some vegetative bacteria, some fungi, some viruses in less than or 10 minutes. And these are my references. And this is a picture of the executive, the charter executive of the Omega Kappa chapter of Sigma. And these are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Chisholm Ford, for such a comprehensive review of high level disinfection. For high level uh, disinfection, and for highlighting that a high level disinfection is the process by which all organisms from inanimate objects are destroyed except for bacterial spores. Uh, you also reminded us about the fact that semi-critical items are the focus of high-level disinfections, and we you listed a few of those items. You spoke about the endoscopes, you, you spoke about laryngoscopes, you spoke about speculums, and so on. You also went on to share with us the steps in high-level disinfection starting with the decontamination, which involves soaking of the instrument, and you had recommended one in 10 bleach solution, as well as cleaning to remove a visible soil as step two. And of course, the catchy phrase, flush, brush, and rinse. Then moving to the actual process of the disinfection, which would involve agents such as alcohol, bleach, and cytic. I will reserve the further comments for our discussion session when we can engage you fully in the process. So again, thank you for an excellent presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. At this, at this time, we will move quickly to our next speaker for the afternoon. And our second speaker is none other than Mrs. Joyet Aiken. Early in life, Joyet felt she could make a difference. And so right after graduating high school, she decided to become a nurse so she could help suffering humanity. That journey began almost 40 years ago at the University Hospital of the West Indies School of Nursing. Most of her clinical experience was gained at UHWI and along the way, she achieved certification in operating theater nursing and midwifery. 
she is proud to declare that her first love is theater nursing as she spent most of her clinical years there and excelled, even debuting as a film star in demonstration videos for scrubbing, gloving and gowning, as well as trolley setting techniques. Following completion of a Master of Science degree in nursing education in 2004, she became the educator in charge of the course in operating theatre techniques at the University Hospital. In 2007, she joined the faculty at the University of the West Indies School of Nursing, where she is currently working as a lecturer, having both academic and administrative responsibilities, including oversight of USON's franchises locally and internationally. She has taught at both the graduate and undergraduate level. Mrs. Aiken is currently enrolled in the PhD program at USON, where her primary research interest lies in issues related to the lived experiences of heart failure, caregiving, and a nurse-led clinic. Professionally, she is a member of the Association of Perioperative Registered Nurses, the American Association of Heart Failure Nurses, a member of the Omega Kappa chapter, and an alumni of the Leadership in Higher Education. She is married to Patrick, and they have two adult children, Dominic and Annelise, and a brand new grandson, Dane. Her two dogs, Nova and Colt, and a feisty parrot named Shaggy. In her spare time, she likes to surf the internet. And after that awesome bio, we have no doubt in her abilities to guide us through the process of sterilization. Mrs. Akins, we welcome you. Please take over. Thank you very much. Um, there is nothing more that you would want to know. I've told you all of it. And so, Without further ado, I'd like to thank the executive of Omega Kappa for inviting me to share on this area. Um, working in the operating theater is something that I really, really enjoyed. And so it's a pleasure for me to share with you about sterilization this afternoon. I'm hoping that by the time we're done, you will understand a little bit about the history of sterilization you'll be able to identify the techniques which are currently in practice. We will talk a little about the advantages and disadvantages of steam and chemical sterilization. Um, we will identify stakeholders in maintaining the standards. And at the end, I hope that you will express a newfound appreciation for the role of CSSD and operating room staff. In terms of the historical background, the issue of sterilization is not new. From ancient times, even though it wasn't recognized as sterilization, the ancients recognized that there was some mystique about fire. They realized that fire took care of infection, even though they, they thought that infections came from, from demon possession but they realized that when they burnt fire or when they burnt whatever, whatever, many times it, it was some bush or whatever it was that they burnt, they got some relief. They identified that there was relief with that. And in the Bible, Moses himself in Deuteronomy and Numbers and Leviticus, there, there, there is evidence that they used fire for purification as well. And throughout the ages coming down, significantly in the 1800s, there was most advancement. And um, even from a nursing perspective, we have Florence Nightingale who played her role in ensuring that the environment had something to do, cleanliness of the environment, had something to do with recovery of the soldiers in the Crimean War. 
and there were other advancements like Mr. Lister who came up with his germ theory and uh, they took advantage of that in, in dosing the operating room and dosing the environment and even patients' wounds with chlorine. And uh, then subsequently there was a German who discovered and it, who invented the autoclave and they built on that. And so we, throughout the ages, we, we currently stand on the shoulders of giants. We are at this point in the 21st century where we are talking about autoclaves and disinfection and sterilization and, and the incidence of surgical infections and wounds infections are significantly less. Surgery is pretty much routine and it is all because we have throughout the ages, we have recognized the importance of sterilization to the advancement of medicine. What though is sterilization? What is sterilization? What, what is it? What does it mean? Uh, there is going to be some overlap in this presentation between mine and Mrs. Ford's because, you know, there is some of the information will overlap. But sterilization is the process by which all pathogenic and non-pathogenic microorganisms, including spores, are destroyed from the surface of an article or in a fluid and to prevent disease transmission associated with the use of that particular item. Mrs. Ford told you about the difference between sterilization and disinfection. Well, when we talk about disinfection, you know, not all microorganisms are killed, but when an item is sterile, it is free of all living microorganisms, including spores. And an article that is sterile is safe for contact with intact and non-intact tissue. It is safe for the vascular system without the risk of infection. Spalding, as you were told earlier, came up with this classification about how to decide which items are going to be sterilized or disinfected. And this, this classification was based on the risk of infection to the patient. So you learned that items were either critical, semi-critical, or non-critical. For the purposes of this talk, we're going to be focusing on critical items. And the critical items are the items which enter sterile tissue, they enter the vascular system, they will enter the, they cross the blood barrier, and any item identified as critical must be subject to the sterilization process. And earlier, somebody identified surgical instruments as being critical items, and they are, as are implants and needles, just to name a few. The methods of sterilization are many, and we're going to be looking at them in a, in a few. But, you know, there are certain principles which guide the process of sterilization. The primary one is that reliable sterilization depends on the contact of the sterilizing agent with all the surfaces of the item being sterilized. So, Bioburden, bioresistance, biostate, bioshielding, and density are all factors that affect sterilization. Bioburden has to do with the degree of contamination or the amount of organic debris that is present. So if there is an instrument that has blood or pus on it, uh, you really you really cannot effectively sterilize that item because there is too much bio burden on it. Remember, part of the, the, um, the, mm. the 
print the guiding mm -hmm. principle is that the sterilizing is must come in contact with all the surfaces of the item being sterilized. So if there if there is pus or blood on an instrument, then that particular area where the pus or the blood is is not coming in contact with the sterilizing agent. So what you will have is um, sterile pus or sterile blood, but underneath that, it's going to be, there, there will be contamination there. Bioresistance has to do with factors such as heat and moisture sensitivity and the product stability. There are some articles that are sensitive to heat or they're sensitive to moisture and they are not stable at all. And so you have to take those factors into consideration when deciding on the method of sterilization to use. So that is what we talk about. That is what we mean when we talk about bioresistance. Biostate has to do with the it has to do with the microorganisms. So the, the stage of the microorganism, is it in a reproductive phase? It is in what kind of microorganism are we, are we hoping to destroy? Those are, are factors that need to be considered. Mrs. Ford told you that there are some um, some microorganisms have an affinity for certain um, body parts. And so, you know, you would, you would decide which, depending on, on what the procedure is going to be, what is going to be done, then you will determine the level or the method of sterilization that is to be used. Bioshielding has to do with the characteristics of the packing material. Are we using paper? Are we using fabric? Are we using a cloth wrapper? What is the packaging? Are we using no packaging at all? That is what we're, we're referring to when we talk about bioshielding. And also the density. Packages that are large, that have multiple layers, that are very heavy. These two affect the, the penetrating of the sterilizing agent and has to be considered. It, it, depending on how dense the package that is being sterilized in, the length of time for sterilization may be prolonged, or if there's no packaging, then the, the, obviously the, the length of time would be lessened. So these are all factors, the bio burden, the bio resistance, the bio state, bioshielding and density are all important factors to consider when selecting the type of sterilization method that is going to be used. And bear in mind always that contact of the sterilizing agent with all the surfaces of the item being sterilized is key. Also, the sterilizing agent to be used depends on the nature of the item being sterilized and the process of sterilization that is being used. All right, so basically there are two methods of sterilization. It's either physical or chemical. If it's a physical method of sterilization, Already. Excuse me, Johanna. Thermal refers to heat under pressure or moist heat. And we, this is what is most commonly used in our environment. And we, we use steam under pressure and moist heat in an autoclave, all right? And uh, there is also hot heat air or dry heat that is thermal and radiation can be done using a microwave or an x-ray i am not aware that we are using either of these um, physical methods of sterilization here but then i 
don't know everything. So if there's somebody who knows different, you can advise us in a little while. For chemical sterilization, there is ethylene oxide gas, there is hydrogen peroxide plasma or vapor, there's formaldehyde, ozone gas, glutaraldehyde solution and paracetic acid, 0.2%. The most common method of chemical sterilization that we use in our context is ethylene oxide gas. Glutaraldehyde or Cydex is also used, but primarily for high level disinfection. Although in the end, Mrs. Ford did tell you that it could be used as a chemical sterilant, which is so. So let us talk about steam sterilization. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the process um, <clears throat> because that is really, um, I think, too much in technical information. But generally, um, we are aware, we know, and most of us would know that steam sterilization is the oldest, it's the safest, most economical method of sterilization in healthcare. It's the preferred method for non-heat and non-moisture sensitive items like surgical instruments, dental instruments, reusable medical equipment, textiles or surgical equipment, especially those that have cavities or lumens. And of course they come in the various sizes. You have large ones that take up whole half of a room and you have small portable autoclaves and there are different types of autoclaves. They, 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 they do what they do in different, there are different mechanisms of action, but the general thing about steam sterilization and autoclaves is that their efficiency depends on one, lowering or limiting the bio burden on the item to be sterilized. And that is key. We, we mentioned that already. And any, whether it is, we're talking about high level disinfection or steam sterilization or any kind of sterilization process. It is very, very important or very critical that bio burden on the item being sterilized is lowered or limited. And how do we do that? We do that by ensuring that these articles are washed and dried before they are before they're they are sterilized, okay? Another point about the efficacy of steam sterilization, it depends on using an effective sterilization cycle. Remember in the slide just before this, we spoke about the density of, um, the density of the packaging so you, you have to ensure that the cycle that you are running for your sterilization is effective. You're not going for too short a period because if you have a, a full autoclave, then you have to make sure that you run for the appropriate period of time it would be significantly less if you were running, if you were just sterilizing a tree, a singular tree of, of instruments or a singular instrument. Excuse me one minute, my computer is about to die. I had it plugged in, but it is not. Oh, and this is still not, why is this not working all of a sudden? 
it's not charging. Okay, then. Participant, I'm going to just ask for your patience. Uh, Mrs. Eakins is trying to get her device plugged in. Okay, I'm good to go again. I'm sorry about that. All of a sudden the plug, the extension was not picking up. All right. Yes, um, where was I? So we have to make sure that we're using an effective sterilization cycle. Also key, and sometimes we don't think about it, is to ensure that we prevent recontamination of the equipment before delivery to the point of use. You know, sometimes we go through the process of sterilization, but the way how we store um, the, the, the sterilized packages is not efficient and they can become contaminated before they are, the, the equipment is actually used. So that's something that we need to think about. And then remember to ensure that our equipment remains sterile. It doesn't become deep, become contaminated before we're ready to use it. Okay, so steam sterilization, the principles that it centers around using steam under pressure, high temperature, and a specific time to achieve sterilization. The process is conducted by supplying steam under pressure into an autoclave. The heat from the condensation of steam envelops the item in the sterilizer and kills the microorganism in an easy and fast manner. And it does this by irreversibly damaging the cells by coagulation. Steam sterilization, the pressure in the, in the autoclave helps to build up the high temperatures necessarily to, necessary to quickly kill the microorganisms. And the two common temperatures, steam sterilizing temperatures are 121 degrees Celsius or 250 degrees Fahrenheit and 132 degrees Celsius or 270 degrees Fahrenheit. And this must be maintained for a minimal time to kill microorganisms. The recognized minimum exposure period for the sterilization of wrapped supplies are 30 minutes at 121 degrees Celsius. And this is if we're using a gravity displacement sterilizer or four minutes at 132 degrees Celsius in a pre-vacuum sterilizer. Now remember earlier I said to you that there are different, there are different kinds of sterilizers. They did their process in different ways. Now the, the um, gravity displacement sterilizer and the pre-vacuum sterilizers are two types of sterilizers that are available. And when we look at the temperatures that we have there, we, you see that those are very, very high temperatures because boiling point for water is 100 degrees Celsius and 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So if we are operating at 121 degrees Celsius and 250 degrees Fahrenheit, you see that really, really, really that height of that height of, of temperature plus the pressure that is in that is in the autoclave, you know, is very efficient or should be very efficient. Yeah. To, to, to kill the microorganisms. Of course, the exposure time 
depends on size and content of the load and the temperature within the sterilizer. So whether it is metal or rubber or plastic, or if the items have lumens, whether the item is wrapped or unwrapped and the type of sterilizer, all of those will determine the, the length of exposure. Now, steam sterilization has specific advantages and disadvantages. Um, in terms of the advantages, we already said that it is the easiest, safest, surest method. The total cycle time is the shortest. It is least expensive when you consider the other options that are available. And it is largely an automatic process. Um, not so much not so much human controls. Of course, humans will humans can will turn on and turn off the autoclave and they will be responsible for monitoring the cycle. But in terms of ensuring the efficiency and the actual working of the autoclave, then that is out of human control. And uh, steam leaves no harmful residue. So that is a, is a very good advantage. The disadvantages are that the precautions for preparing and packaging and loading and operating and drying the load can be quite onerous. Um, there are specific guidelines for those of you who work in the operating theater or in CSSB. You would, you would know that in terms of, in terms of um, how you have to prepare, prepare the, the packages, prepare the sets, the cleaning and the decontamination process and the, the wrapping, it can be quite onerous. And there is a spec there are specific guidelines for loading and for operating and drying. It takes time. So that could be disadvantage. Some people could see that as being a disadvantage. Of course, uh, the literature gives um, the fact that the items need to be clean and free of grease and oil and not be heat sensitive as a disadvantage. But um, really, when you think about it, if you if sterilization is what you are after, then the items really do need to be clean and free of any debris. The steam must be able to penetrate packaging and contact all areas of the item being sterilized. So, so this is a disadvantage in uh, that you have to be selective about the kind of packaging that you choose you choose for, for use. And the time for drying depends on the size of the load. So there's room for human error there because we can underestimate the time that is needed for a particular, for a particular load to be dry. One big disadvantage is that the steam may not be pure and if the steam is not pure, then the whole, the whole um, load would be not just stained, but contaminated. And um, usually there is no way to know this until, unless, unless the specific um, quality assurance runs are, are being done routinely. But sometimes you won't know until you see a package comes out and it is stained. Then that should raise a red flag about the, the, the quality of the process. Flash sterilization is, um, is a process that um, people who work in the operating theater would be familiar with. It, it is used for unwrapped 
clean instruments that cannot be packaged or sterilized and stored before use. It should not be used for convenience or for routine sterilization of incomplete instrument of complete instrument sets and is used when there is insufficient time to sterilize an item by the preferred package method. Um, typically, flash sterilization is used if a surgeon needs an instrument urgently, it wasn't in the set and it was previously used and is currently not sterile so that one, one instrument can be flashed as we call it. Um, or if a, an instrument that is crucial to the, the operation, if it falls on the ground and the surgeon needs it and there is no other replacement, then that instrument may be um, retrieved and cleaned and flash sterilized. It shouldn't be used for reasons of convenience or as an alternative to purchasing additional instrument sets or to save time. It is not recommended for implantable devices. That is devices that are placed into a surgically or a naturally formed cavity of the human body. Um, you, you, you would appreciate that any device that is going, any implant needs to be, you know, we take special care with ensuring um, sterilization of those items. So how, do, how are items for steam sterilization prepared? Head of the list is that the organic material must be removed and the items must be thoroughly rinsed and dried before sterilization. Um, some people think the drying is a little much because it's going to get wet, but um, the principle is that it should be washed and dried. Removable parts are disassembled, box locks are opened. Um, if there are if there are screws, they are to be checked. Uh, you if there are sharp components, those are checked as well. Um, to make sure that everything is intact. Heavy instruments, in, in any set, there are some instruments that are larger and heavier. Those are to be placed at the bottom of the tree and the weight in the tree evenly distributed. Remember and be careful about how we layer, um, layer instruments on top of each other because the, the the principle is that the, the, um, the steam must be able to make contact with all the areas of the items that are being sterilized. And if we have, if we have instruments lying on top of each other, then that is not going to be a very efficient process. So we have to be, especially if they are very large items, so we have to be very careful about how the, the tree, the instruments are, are placed in the tree. If there are basins and they are nested, then they, they are supposed to be separated by toweling. So you don't have two metal, two, two trays, two basins nested. They are to be separated by toweling. And... Uh, Best practice recommends that sponges and drapes should not be included in basins because the steam can, could be deflected from penetrating the fabric. For drape packs, the linens are to be folded closely, so folded loosely so steam can penetrate easily and packs should not weigh more than 12 pounds. For one, they're going to be too dense, and two, they're going to be heavy to lift. So um, in it, when you consider ergonomics, that's a large, a big area of concern in the operating room, lifting heavy packs. Uh, we have to be careful about that as well. If there is rubber tubing to be 
steam sterilized. It should be coiled loosely, wrapped loosely with gauze. It should not touch metal or glass during the sterilization process. And for tubes, a uh, residue of distilled water should be in the tube, in the lumen of the tubes. So the tubes are supposed to be sterilized wet so that the steam can form inside the tube and perform it, its sterilizing process. And rubber bands shouldn't be used around solid items. Wooden items should not be steam sterilized. And always there should be sterility indicators inside the, the pack and on the outside of the pack as well. In terms of loading the sterilizer, packages should be positioned so there's free circulation and the steam can penetrate and uh, there is no entrapment of steam and water. Wire racks are used to prevent packages from touching the autoclave chamber walls, the floor of the autoclave or the ceiling and basins are typically placed on the side to allow air to flow out of it. And the, the picture that's inserted there, you can see the pack, the tree, surgical tree that is wrapped the indicator tape on the outside and on the inside, there would be indicators and a surgical sterility indicator as well. Note the rack, the wire racks that prevent the packages from touching the floor, the sides or the ceiling of the autoclave. Timing the load. The timing of the sterilization cycle begins when the desired temperature is reached. So um, once the door to the sterilizer is closed and the sterilizer is turned on, it takes a couple minutes for the temperature to be reached. And you, you can observe that if you stand up to watch it on the, the dial in, in, in the front of the sterilizer. Um, you can use a manual timer, but newer model autoclaves have their own timers that will go off when the cycle is completed. For drying, the sterilizer door is opened at the end of the cycle and packages are left untouched. And it, the timing depends on the on the amount of the, or the number of packages and the size of the packages in, in the autoclave. So it can be as little as 15 minutes or as much as an hour for drying. Biologic indicators, um, separate and apart from the ster sterility indicators that are put in in every package and in every load, the, the sterilizers the, or the autoclaves are tested weekly to ensure that sterility is maintained. And uh, they use what is called the Bowie, Bowie Dick test. That is one of the tests that they use to ensure that the sterilizers are, are working properly and are maintaining sterility. So steam sterilization, I told you, is the most common physical sterilization method. Ethylene oxide gas sterilization is the most common chemical sterilization method that we use in this context. Um, so ethylene oxide is a gas it's a chemical agent and it's used to sterilize items that are heat or moisture sensitive. The process of ethylene oxide sterilization interferes with the normal metabolism of microorganisms and results in cell death. Ethylene oxide gas is highly flammable and explosive in air, so it must be used in an explosive proof chamber in a controlled environment. And uh, I didn't know this, I found it out when I was preparing, 
that in the US, there is actually a law that says that employee exposure records are to be kept for up to 30 years. And this is because ethylene oxide is a very potent carcinogenic. So there are four parameters necessary for ethylene oxide sterilization. One has to do with the concentration of gas, of the gas itself. So they use high pressure cylinders that have liquefied ethylene oxide in it. The temperature is important and there is actually some steam involved in it. But compared to steam sterilization, this is actually, um, this, these temperatures are low. 85 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's low temperature and there is some steam in it because humidity, 30 to 80% humidity is needed to, for the efficiency of the cycle. But excessive moisture affects the process and inhibits sterilization. So it's just enough humidity, just enough heat and just enough time for complete destruction of the microorganisms. The time for sterilization is dependent on the concentration of the gas and the temperature of the gas. But um, ethylene oxide sterilization can take anywhere between three to five hours. So it's a pretty longish, pretty long process. The advantage though of ethylene oxide sterilization is that it is an if very effective substitute to use for sterilizing items that cannot be used for steam sterilization. It is non-corrosive, it will not damage material. It completely permeates all porous materials. It leaves no residue and ethylene oxide sterilization is used extensively in commercial preparations for um, articles that have a prolonged shelf life. The disadvantage is that the process itself is quite complicated. The, it, it's longer than for steam sterilization. The equipment is very expensive. The, you have these pressure cylinders, you have to have a room specifically designated climate control. It has to be vented. Um, the gas itself is very expensive. It is a known human carcinogen. It causes leukemia. It's a mutagen. It causes spontaneous abortions in persons who are exposed to it. It can cause genetic effects and neurological dysfunction in people who have to monitor it um, in developed countries. Well, up to the time when I was working in the operating theater, we never had, um, we never had, what do you call those? The monitors, you know, the monitors that the x-ray people use to measure their exposure to, to radiation similar kinds of um, similar kinds of monitors are to be used to, to measure exposure to ethylene oxide. Uh, the aeration time, because, because ethylene oxide gas permeates all porous material, all the packages that have been sterilized by this method have to be completely aerated and they have to be aerated for a minimum of seven to 21 days before the items can be used. We are not allowed to handle them. If you have to handle them, you have to be wearing PPE to protect yourself, including goggles because the gas exposure to the gas and the, the, the fumes can cause damage to your eyes as well. So it's very toxic. Like we said, it's a, it's a known human carcinogen. So we've looked at 
steam sterilization and we've looked at ethylene oxide sterilization, the two most common uh, methods of sterilization that we use in this country. Um, so now our package, we've sterilized our equipment. How do we maintain sterility? Shelf life is important and um, we have to make sure that the storage conditions as well under which the sterile packages are stored is optimum and uh, that supplies are rotated and the principle is first in is last out first in last out and uh, so let's let's look at shelf life so sterility is event related it is not time related unless the package contents are unstable so normally on 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 items that have been sterilized there is an expiry date on the package i the best practice And, and it's a little awkward for me to say this, but the best practice as I, I read is that sterility is event related, not time related unless package contents are unstable. So in, in our, at the university hospital, I know that paper bags are, are used for items that are that are going to be, that have a, a fairly short shelf life and they're usually sterile for, they're given a, an expiry date of two weeks. Cloth packages last longer, I think they are for a month and packages that are in, in plastic bags or, oh, the name of the packaging slips me right now, but they have a three month, three three months sterility shelf life but the literature suggests that sterility is event related not time related unless the package contents are unstable so if if storage conditions are optimum if they are if packages are stored in a, in a room they are stored off the floor off the wall they are stored there is good ventilation there is open shelving, there's restricted trafficking, so you don't have people passing by and um, touching the packaging. Then as long as the package remains intact, then they should, they should be okay, unless the contents are unstable, all right? And of course, the rotation of supplies is important and uh, daily checks to ensure that package, the packaging remains intact, paper bag is not torn, it's not wet, and so on. So there is that, there is a lot of, there should be a lot of effort in making sure that the hard work put in to sterilize packages they 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 should be maintained optimally so who are the stakeholders who who are the person who the persons who are responsible for for sterility for sterilization in in the institutions first at the top of the list is the infection prevention and control department. They have come into their own now, particularly in this COVID era. Everybody is recognizing the importance of the infection prevention and control unit. They are the persons who create policies, they conduct audits, they ensure compliance with practice standards, they are the ones who mandate the biologic indicator monitoring, infection control and prevention department, including 
the nurses who are in that in that department are very very important they are the major stakeholders the central sterile supply department is also important they are important stakeholders they are the persons who provide disinfection and sterilization services for the institutions they not just provide disinfection and sterilization services they also store and distribute sterile packages and medical devices hospital wide so they play a very important role the clinical departments are the ones who use this the services of the central sterile supply department their responsibilities include safe handling of used instruments making sure that instruments are not thrown out in the in the garbage or in the laundry making sure that they are decontaminated they are soaked before soaked or kept moist before they are returned and even washed before they are returned to central sterile department and safe transportation to cssd for re reprocessing that is part of their remit as well to make sure that the the sets are kept together that they are not um, that the different parts components of sets you know that sets are not mixed up because that can be very frustrating mm -hmm. how many times have you asked for a set and the components in it are missing we don't want that happening so you have a responsibility as clinical staff to ensure that the components of the sets are kept together and in your department if you actually have to store sterile items please make sure that it is done efficiently another stakeholder is the risk management or the quality control department um, their responsibility has to do with ensuring healthy a healthy workforce in compliance to institutional recommendation of staff immunization and checks because if staff staff is not well staff is sick they are going to be spreading infection and disease around the hospital and if you have members in in CSS, if you have staff members in cssd or in the operating room who are sick then you know they are prone to be spreading infection there then the the risk management quality control also ensures appropriate training for staff that is part of their responsibility as well as to investigate breaches so if there is a problem with the sterilizer it's not functioning well infection prevention department picks that up then the risk management quality control people have to also investigate that as well safe handling is important we we have spoken several times about handling contaminate making sure that equipment is free of bio burden it is important that the persons who have to decontaminate the equipment wear the appropriate PPE. Okay, the objective of decontamination is to protect the preparation and package workers who come in contact with this equipment after the decontamination process to ensure that they don't contract any diseases from the microorganisms on those devices. So it is recommended that they wear 
appropriate PPE, including goggles. The gowns that they wear should be water resistant. They should be wearing gloves and boots and caps and goggles. And uh, the equipment when they they um, used equipment is being transported. It should be covered and not transported openly. Their attire, well, we just said that, you know, the way how they should be attired. Moisture resistant barriers for their gowns, pretty much like the surgeons wear shoe covers, rubber or plastic gloves, ear covering. During a manual cleaning process, when splashing can occur, they should wear safety goggles and a face mask. When they're sorting contaminated equipment, they should ensure that they are wearing the full personal protective attire. Uh, how many times have we seen the the um, assistants washing up and they're not properly attired. That is something that needs to change Wait, because we're looking at safety here and best practice. Soaking of the equipment may be necessary if, they're, if these are equipment that have lumens or if the equipment have complex design and so they are filled with debris or if, they, if the instruments are very bloody and if they cannot be rinsed or wiped, then they are soaked. And if they're soaked, it is usually in an enzymatic detergent that is preferable. So the washing can be done manually or there are some institutions that have mechanical washers to do this job. So what I just mentioned is primarily the function of CSSD and they have also, they play a major, major role in maintaining sterility in any healthcare institution they have to do deal with the decontamination, the assembly and packaging, they do sterile storage, and they distribute across the hospital. So the, this is some of what they do. They check the instruments, and this is also done in the operating theater and they string the instruments, put them on strings and put them in, pack them in the pan, in the, oh my goodness. What happened here? They package them. But I think I am at the end, pretty much at the end of my presentation. I'm not quite sure what happened just now. Looks like I came out of my presentation. But we're at the end of the presentation. I hope you learned something that you would have a newfound appreciation for people who work hard to maintain sterility in the institutions within which you work. So when next you have to ask for a dressing set, when next you have a patient who recovers from surgery without a wound infection, when next you need sterile equipment, remember to think about the process and to think about your own role in the process of sterilization and how far we've come and what we can do to ensure that at the end of it, our clients, our patients are best served. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Aiken, for an excellent presentation on sterilization and for highlighting that sterilization in, is the destruction or elimination of any type of living organize, organism from materials on the process, including spores. You also mentioned that sterilization is used for 
critical um, items such as uh, surgical equipment, central catheters, and so on. You also mentioned that there are, there are methods of sterilization, and you mentioned the physical uh, method, such as steam under pressure, hot air, or dry heat. And you also mentioned the chemical process, such as the ethylene oxide gas, which is generating a lot of questions <laughs> in the chat, which I'm going to share with you shortly. And you also highlighted the important role of infection prevention and control department, quality improvement, and risk management during the process of, of uh, sterilization. And having done that little recap, I am going to open the floor for the robust discussion that I, I know is awaiting us and also the questions um, that were posed. Uh, so several questions were posed uh, from uh, Ms. Chisholm's presentation, as well as yours, and I will share the ones that were posted in the chat um, first, and then I will um, open the floor for persons who want to share with us um, verbally. Um, and so we had a question from Ms. Harris, Kadian Harris, this is from Mrs. Chisholm Ford. Uh, she questioned the, the use of bleach as a, as a disinfectant, disinfection. She, she wants to know if the current practice is wrong since bleach is used as, a main, as the main disinfecting agent and no cleaning of the organic matter from the instrument is done first before soaking. She said that during your presentation, you um, mentioned that the organic material would inactivate the bleach solution. So she wants a little bit of clarification on that. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, let me try to understand the question. Um, is my colleague asking about the point that I made that the, I'm sorry, my camera doesn't work so well, that the, when I said in my presentation that bleach inactivated, uh, bleach was deactivated or inactivated by organic material. Is that the question? Yes, she wants, yes, she wants that, clarity on that. Yes. Well, that is correct. The CDC says that um, organic material breaks down bleach in that when, when, when I mention organic material, I mean large amounts. So if you have small parts of particles of body tissue or um, mucus or blood, Bleach can remove that, but if it is in large quantities, it will inactivate the bleach. So if you have large quantities of organic material and uh, the general principle or practice is that we would normally pour the bleach on the organic material with the intent that it would break the organic material down, that is not correct practice the correct practice is to clean up the excess and afterwards you use the high level disinfection process, which is the one in 10 solution of bleach to clean up afterwards. So you remove the excess organic material, then you use your bleach. And I hope I did Thank answer you. the question. Thank you, Mrs. Chisholm Ford. Um, Ms. Harris, Ms. Will Mrs. Williams Harris, I'm hoping that um, answered your question. So you clean first and then you, you uh, clean the excess first and then you uh, use the bleach solution afterwards. Mrs. Harris had a question for Mrs. Aiken. And the question is, is ethylene oxide sterilization done in Jamaica? And is there a law in Jamaica that speaks to those persons who are exposed to this gas? 
Yes, ethylene oxide sterilization is done here. I am not aware of a law. The one that I mentioned, I, I, I just came across it when I was preparing. I was not aware previously that there was a law about that. But when I have always known that ethylene oxide is a known carcinogen, and we always know that, you know, you should take care when you're handling it, but um, the extent, the complete extent to include monitoring for 30 years, I was not aware of that. All, all right, and there's a follow-up to that question from Miss Kennedy, and she's asking if the ethylene oxide sterilization is so toxic, why is it used any at all? <laughs> because it is very effective, and there are many, many items that cannot be heat or steam sterilized. So take, for instance, a lot of the equipment they use for open heart or neurosurgery cannot be steam sterilized. So if you, if care, proper planning is done and care is taken in terms of ensuring that the articles are aerated for the time specified, then that is, um, that would be good. The benefits, I think, outweigh the risks. All right, thank you. And Mrs. Mulrain, I think that would have answered your question as well, um, which was really asking <laughs> why isn't it banned, right? So the benefits in this case um, outweighs the risk of its use. Um, another uh, question for you, another question for you, uh, Mrs. Aiking, and this yes. is from Ms. Rosemary. She wants you to clarify the first in, last out um, method with regards to the sterilization. I, I, I just saw that question and realized that I made a big mistake. It is actually FIFO, first in, first out. It is not first right. in, last out. It is FIFO, first in, first out. So um, I'm sorry, that was a, a mistake that I made. Thank you. The concept Thank is so first in, first out. Thank you very much for that. So Thank you for picking up on that. Um, who was it? But yes. whoever it was, thank you so much for picking um, up on that. All right. Um, so I have, a, I see a raise of hand here from it. William, Ms. Williams, I have acknowledged you and I'm going to ask you to see. Ms. 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 Kadian Williams, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. It's just following up on the ethylene oxides means of sterilizing. Um, in light of the, the fact that it is so carcinogenic and can cause miscarriage and all these things, like, are there policies then in the hospital given the risk involved and are these persons who are exposed and given the proper PPEs um, basically to protect themselves? Um, I am not currently in practice in operating theater, but when I used to work in the operating theater, um, persons were aware that I don't, I, I'm not sure that there are actual policies written about it, but I know that persons are told, the persons who are responsible for monitoring the um, ethylene oxide sterilization, they are, they are given guidelines as to how to manage it, like to ensure that they I, I, I do not recall, I honestly do not recall um, people wearing PPE to manage it because it was vented outside and all there was was the, the, the opening, like an opening to a vault and the vault would be opened and it would be vented on the outside. And we know that stuff are to be aerated for a particular period of time and after it's monitored and when the, the time has expired, 
the the sterilized packages are allocated to the different units to which they belong. But I, I'm not sure that there are written policies. That is something that um, quality assurance uh, or even the individual un, the individual operating theaters need to look at. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Akins. Uh, I'm hoping that answers your question, Ms. Williams. I will move on to another question in the chat. And this one is to Mrs. Chisholm Ford. And it looks like a two-part question. So one, can you advise on the effective exposure time for hand sanitizers, especially those of the approved type and concentration? That's the first. And the second part is, how effective is household bleach for sanitization when mixed with other chemicals such as detergents or if, if it's heated? Thank you very much for that question. Can you, let me answer the first question first. Um, just remind me of that question, please. Can you advise on the effective exposure time for hand sanitizers? especially those of the approved type and concentration. Okay, uh, thank you again. The, if we all notice that the hand sanitizers, they come in concentrations, most of them are 70% or more alcohol, ethylene alcohol or isopropyl alcohol. And they are very effective um, in protecting against microorganisms with, with the same time that it takes to do a hand wash, that's the same length of time you need to use um, to do your hand rub when you're doing your sanitizer. So you would do 20 seconds of hand washing. So you are expected to do 20 seconds of hand rub when you are using your sanitizers for effectiveness. However, it is you are required to do a wash with soap and water after a maximum five sanitizers. Because as I've said in my presentation, that you seem to have lost. Um, Sorry, I, no, I was muted. I, it says I was muted by the host. Okay, apologies. And mm. that's okay. Um, as I was saying, colleagues, they, that you should wash your hand with soap and running water after a maximum of five washes because high-level disinfection does not protect against endospores. So after five, after five sanitizers, you'll find that the endospores are building up on your hands. So you need to wash with soap and running water and dry with a disposable towel. And I will now take the second part of the question. How effective is household bleach for sanitization when mixed with other chemicals such as detergents or when it is heated? Um, it is not recommended that you mix household bleach with any other chemical it does not increase its effectiveness. It, as a matter of fact, it decreases its effectiveness. So um, household bleach is to be used as a one in 10 solution for your regular high level disinfection. When used with other chemicals, it produces other gases that are potent that can be irritating to the eyes, to the respiratory system, and to the skin. So it is not recommended to be used with anything but diluted with water to form a one in 10 solution. I hope I answered the question. Thank you for that uh, response, Mrs. Chisholm Ford. Um, I will entertain questions from our YouTube or YouTube participants. 
Mrs. Gary. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I don't have any questions at this time from YouTube. I do have a few comments. Um, they are yes, saying it's an, they're excellent presentations. They are noticing that they are hoping that at the point where they're sterilizing with some of these products that they are time sensitive and that handling and storage is very important. Um, they are looking at the fact that with hazardous processes that may be involved, that necessary steps are followed. And overall, there are lots of caps going on over here and flowers and glasses clinking on the presentations. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, thank you and very I, much. I concur with those responses. The, the presentations were indeed excellent. I have a comment from Serena Douglas, and she says to add to the discussion, alcohol-based hand sanitizers are highly effective against non-spore-forming organisms, but they do not kill C, C. diff spores or remove C. difficile from your hands or from the hands. Uh, and we're concurring with that, um, uh, Mrs. Chisholm Ford, are we not? Yes, 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 we are. Yes, thank you. Do you, participants, are there any other questions? You may raise your hand for those persons who are on Zoom and I will acknowledge you. Any questions? If you have no questions, do you want to share a comment? Any comments? Any comments? I'm going to read some of the comments from the chat. Um, excellent presentation. Thank you for that information. Thank you for the clarification. I think that that comment was from the first in um, first out, uh, first in last out um, comment. So she's thanking you for that cl um, clarification. Um, congratulations, colleagues. The presentations were comprehensive. Um, John Richards, I'm not sure what this comment is. Five or three. Uh, what are you asking? Would you like to open your mic and clarify for me? Well, thank you. I was um, I was a little bit surprised that she, um, Mrs. Chisholm Ford said, after five use of the hand rub, you should. Um, I um, and thank you, Dion. Maximum five. It depends on the situation that you are in. Um, researchers have said three, but the, you can go to a maximum of five. All right, thank you. I appreciate that because all along I was hearing um, three and it was a first three was maximum five. Right, yes, I'm not saying thanks. I've never heard of the, 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 the five, but thanks. All right. Thank you for that comment. Um, and Dion, you again, you were saying that uh, you were told that bleach is broken down when used with hot water. Repeat that question, please. Um, bleach is broken down when used with hot water. Right, I was just like to comment um, because um, I was told that um, when you, like when you have a mixture of bleach, if you use hot water than cold water, then um, it makes it effect, um, ineffective. So I was just asking if you have any clarification or you concur with that um, info. Yes, 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 Dion, I do concur. So when you are mixing your bleach solution, it is recommended, thank you very much for that addition, it is recommended that you use room temperature water. Thank you, Mrs. Chisholm Ford, and I will take the liberty of calling you Dion as well, and Dion. Um, another comment, great presentation, well needed information, and we concur with that. We have a question we have a comment from YouTube, from YouTube, Ms. Carol Johnson. She's saying very good presentation. Um, 
And her question is, do you know if persons who use the ethylene or do the ethylene oxide sterilization is given an incentive? Not as far as I'm aware. That one is for you. Not as far as I'm aware. Not as far okay. as I'm aware. All right. Can I comment on that one? Um, can I sure. comment? Go ahead, Mrs. I, I, I think that's a good point for my colleague to raise as it relates to uh, an incentive or uh, an allowance. I think it is something that they could um, bring to the association that it could be a negotiated item. It's a very good suggestion. Thank you for that, Mrs. Chisholm Ford. And Mrs. Chisholm Ford is an active member of the Nurses Association of Jamaica. And so that, that comment and recommendation has been flagged. And so, um, Ms. Carol Johnson, listen out for something on that in the, in the future. Actually, um, actually, actually, Judy, may I, may I please? Certainly, oh, at, sure, at the I, certainly, when I used to work at the university hospital, it was, was the um, auxiliary staff who were responsible for monitoring the, um, monitoring the, the, the ethylene oxide sterilization. They were the ones responsible for, for washing instruments and packaging them and so on. So that is typically the, the category of, of persons, not necessarily the, the, the nurses who did that. All right, so another point on the table. So it was the unlicensed assistive personnel's responsibility. Right. Um, I'm not sure for the other institutions, if uh, anybody can mention from another institution, if that is what obtained in your institution as well. Um, you can indicate by a raise of hand and I will acknowledge you. Um, I will continue to read a few more comments before I hand over to um, the president. Uh, very good presentation. I have learned of some new information and will, that will be of help in my everyday, everyday practice. Um, thanks for lead, great sharing. Um, I agree given the risk, I'm thinking this is probably the incentive um, comment that the person was um, agreeing with. Um, Ms. Marcia Cameron Dawkins, very vital information, excellent presentation, and I wish all the persons who work in the CSP, SSB are aware of this information. And this comment is coming from our guest on YouTube. Presenters did an, a great job and I enjoyed the presentation. We'll apply what was learned. Uh, thank you participants, thank you presenters. Excellent job. And um, I will now hand over to our president for her closing remarks. Thank you one and all. Thank you so much, um, Madam Moderator. Um, good afternoon again, everyone. Thank you very much, Mrs. Henry Alexander. Wonderful job. Thank you, Mrs. Chisholm Ford and Mrs. Aiken. The um, kudos are raining in and the persons are asking, so we may have to copyright some of the presentations and share them for educational purposes. Now, before I just close in our usual fashion with a little bit about um, Omega Kappa and Sigma in general, I would just wish to acknowledge the winners of our little prize. Now, Mrs. Aiken, I have to say that you did great, but let me be fair and say that as one of the presenters and a member of Omega Kappa, we had to disqualify you just a little bit, if that's okay. <laughs> so with that being said, um, we had uh, several persons with a few nines, tens, and elevens, but we had three people with 12, um, one of them was Mrs. Aiken. I reached out to both persons, one who had 11. I asked for both persons on YouTube with 12, only one responded. And so after verifying um, where on the picture they were able to mark the faces, we would like to congratulate Mrs. Nicola Allen Palmer on winning because she found the 12 faces. 
And so we just wanna give her a little clap. Congratulate her, she'll be contacted after regarding her prize. And all of us could go back and maybe look because there are actually 15 faces in the diagram. All right, so with that being said, we just want to tell you a little bit about our parent body. So we are the Omega Kappa chapter of Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society of Nursing. Is a mouthful. We just call ourselves Sigma today. And it was started by six nursing students who were at the Indiana University School of Nursing. So our headquarters is in Indianapolis in the United States. And our vision, we have meetings and conventions and business of the organization done every two years. So this biennium, our vision includes that we are looking at connected empowered nurse leaders who are transforming global healthcare. And the mission is that we want to develop nurse leaders anywhere so we can improve healthcare everywhere. Now persons are able to join if they are students and or nursing leaders. And we will share with you in just a second, but we do want to let you know that Sigma has over 135,000 active members in more than a hundred countries in about 540 active chapters. So if you're an undergraduate student, you want to be in your nursing program, bachelor's program or equivalent, we're looking at achieving academic excellence based on the criteria of your school, should be in the highest 35% of your nursing class. You should have completed a half of your curriculum. And if you're doing an RN to BSN, then you should have completed at least 12 credit hours. And our graduate students, we're looking at completing a quarter of the curriculum again, achieving academic excellence. And of course, we expect you to meet academic integrity standards. And our nursing leaders should be legally recognized to practice in their countries have a minimum of a bachelor degree or the equivalent in any field and should be demonstrating achievement and excellence in nursing. And so we just wanna let you know that for Sigma itself, we're looking at things like career mentorship, access to professional um, development courses for nurses, access to our very large e-repositories, chock full of data, the opportunity to network and volunteer, conferences, webinars, and other sessions. And most recently during the pandemic, Sigma has opened up all of their webinars or almost all of them to nurses anywhere. So if you see some things coming around that says Sigma, you're free to join. When you register, it will ask if you're a member or not. And some of those same benefits apply depending on the chapter you're a part of. Now our chapter, this is Omega Kappa. This is our chartering in May, 2019. We are located at the U.S. School of Nursing, Mona but we do have members in Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, the Bahamas in the US and in the UK. Although some of our members are living in these countries, there are some that are actually from Nigeria, Guyana and Haiti. And so we do have nursing students and nursing leaders. Um, last week we had moderating from two of our colleagues in education. Today, Mrs. Henry Alexander is from the clinical space. We will have colleagues from other countries for the other sessions and we will have a nursing student moderating as well. We just wanted to share a little bit of who we are and what we've been doing. And this is how you may find us. You may go to the Sigma Nursing webpage, to the Omega Kappa Sigma Nursing webpage. We are on Facebook as the Omega Kappa chapter. And we're on Instagram at Omega underscore Kappa underscore Caribbean. And of course, you know how to find us via our email. We just want to remind you to be the nurse who you want to work with and to ensure that when your patients even forget your name, they won't forget how you made them feel because it's a good feeling. We thank you for joining us today and we look forward to having you for the rest of this week and the next week when we look at our non-nursing hours. So thank you for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your evening. I don't know if there are any other last comments. Just in case, let me double check. I saw the chat blinking away, Mrs. Alexander. All right, so if there's anything else, we want to thank our members who joined us on here, our colleagues, and those who joined us on YouTube as well. We thank you for staying with us despite all the technical difficulties that we had. And we want to just thank you so much for your support that you've been giving to this series so far. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye.